Okay, it's 5.30, so why don't we start? Um, I want to welcome everybody to our webinar. My name is Scott Zeki. I'm the, um, the representative for District 26, which includes areas from Macaulay to Kakako and part of downtown. Um, my uh, co-host this evening and co-sponsor of this event is Representative Della Al-Balati, who I will introduce after I finish speaking. Um, I'm just going to, I just wanted to give a very brief welcome again to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Representative Bilotti will be introducing our panelists. Uh, we are going to be discussing a very important topic tonight. It's the issue of, of, of uh, facing renters, the eviction uh, moratorium, and the ways that renters can avoid eviction. Um, you know, when the legislature met in session in 2021, uh, we knew that the eviction moratorium would eventually come to an end. And uh, one of our members, Representative Troy Hashimoto, who's the vice chair of our House Housing Committee, worked throughout the entire session to craft legislation to create a mediation program for renters. And that's primarily what we'll be discussing this evening. And Representative Hashimoto is on uh, our webinar with us as well. So I'd like to just turn it over to uh, Representative Baladi at this point. Brett Baladi. Thank you, Speaker Psyche. Uh, again, my name is Della Albalati and I represent District 24, Makiki, Tantlis, uh, Makali, parts of Popokolea and Manoa. I neighbor speak, uh, Speaker Psyche's district. So we have some of the hi highest, most dense um, condo packed districts in urban Honolulu. And I just wanna send out my initial thanks to this wonderful group that we have with us for the next hour, uh, led by Rep Troy Hashimoto from Maui. Uh, this is a group of stakeholders who really put together uh, this piece of legislation that we believe is going to be helping um, people across uh, the state address this thorny issue of evictions during the time of pandemic. So without much further ado, I wanna turn this over to Rep Troy Hashimoto. He's gonna be introducing, uh, or he'll be leading into our speakers who are gonna be in this order, Jillian Okamoto from Catholic Charities Hawaii, followed by um, Dan Omiara and um, David Chi, both of Legal Aid and um, uh, house, Housing Law Background for David. Sorry, David, you're gonna to have to um, say what your, your um, what your firm is. And then Tracy Wilkin from Mediation Center of the Pacific. So I wanna thank all of them for being here. They really are the brain trust that helped us uh, develop what I believe is actually one of the, program, the leading programs in the nation that's trying to help kind of navigate this difficult process um, uh, of this pandemic. So without much further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rep Troy Hashimoto. Thanks so much, Della and Speaker, for allowing me to join you tonight. And thank you for hosting this very important set webinar. It's a, it's a very important topic and it's a very confusing topic. And I first wanna start by thanking both of you because you know, al although we worked really hard, these are many members of the working group who came up with this legislation are on this webinar tonight, but without your support, uh, House leadership support, both majority leader and the speaker, we wouldn't have had this piece of legislation. You, you two bought in early that this was a problem and really wanted to find a solution to, to make this a kind of a soft landing for those who are facing eviction. And without your leadership, we wouldn't be here today. So thank you for, for your foresight in making this happen. I think just to kind of give an overview of where we're at at this point, um, you know, we've kind of been the, about a few weeks since August 6 happened. And August 6 was the last day that the state eviction moratorium was in effect for the state of Hawaii. And this has been going on for almost a year, you know, a little over a year of having all of the evictions kind of be paused, rent increases were paused. I think we were in a state of limbo because of coronavirus. And I think the governor decided because Act 57 was in place and because people were starting to get back to work, he was okay allowing the eviction, statewide eviction moratorium to ease. I think what is very confusing is that at the same time, the federal government uh, really started to look at evictions nationwide and not all states have an Act 57 in place. So that is why they decided to impose a Center for Disease Control uh, mandate of eviction moratoriums um, nationwide. And so now in, in the state of Hawaii, we never had to look at the CDC moratorium because the statewide moratorium always trumped the CDC moratorium. And so that's why it was never talked about here in Hawaii, but because we allowed our statewide eviction moratorium to end, it gets a little confusing because now we have to interact between Act 57 
and the nationwide CDC moratorium. And so those are two big things that we need to understand tonight and really understand how to move forward with these two, uh, two items interacting with each other. Now, one of the things that you should know is that in this climate, you now have to be proactive. I think the statewide moratorium really allowed people to kind of just sit in place and not really have to do much until it ended. But now because that ended, for the CDC moratorium, you do have to apply for, you have to sign a self-attestation form, a self-certification to say that you meet certain criteria. Under the statewide moratorium, you did not. So that is new. So even if you do feel like you um, fall under the, the CDC moratorium, you do have to uh, apply, uh, sign that self-certification. For the um, Act 57, which is the, the law that the legislature passed, you do have to do mandatory mediation if the your landlord sends you a notice and you that's that you have to go through that specific process that we created and that is you do have to be proactive in responding to the mediation center and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of the questions the lingering questions of what mediation really is all about i think tracy wilkin of the mediation center of the pacific has been very good in explaining what that process is and putting kind of fears at rest because i think some people really look at mediation it may be uh, sometimes intimidating, but it really is not. I think the success rate is proven and we're very, very proud that Tracy has taken this on because we think that it's, it is that soft landing that people need. And so I think we will all have to watch what, what happens because we're hoping that the, the biggest thing that people do, even though the statewide eviction moratorium has ended, is applying for rental relief because there is a tremendous amount of rental assistance out there that is available to residents of Hawaii who are 80% uh, area medium income and below. And I know Catholic Charities is on the call tonight, so they will be able to explain what that criteria is, but there's tremendous amount of federal funds there that should be deployed throughout the state of Hawaii. Because let's face it, if we don't use up to 65% or obligate 65% of those funds by September 30th, we may have to give that back to the federal government. So we want to spend as much of those federal dollars to get to working families as possible because we want to have those federal funds stay in Hawaii. So there is a milestone we have to meet and we really want people to apply for federal rental relief. So lots, lots to discuss in terms of where, how everything in, interacts, but I think we have great resources tonight that will help us. Again, this the Act 57 will be in place once the CDC moratorium ends because the CDC moratorium will end sooner than later. There is a timeline of October 3rd that it may end uh, if the federal government does not extend it. Uh, and so we are co also continually watching what that means at the federal level because there has been a few lawsuits with the CDC moratorium. So that may end at any time. Also, if our COVID rates drop for two weeks, it may end. But Act 57 is there and the, the, the heart of Act 57 is moving a mandatory mediation instead of after court filing to before court filing. So we didn't want you to be waiting in line to have to go through mediation after a judge orders you to do so. So we essentially said, hey, let's make this process smoother by ordering mediation before you go before a judge. And hopefully throughout that mediation process, you don't you can find you can get to a some type of uh, agreement with uh, between a landlord and tenant and you don't even have to go to court and the mediation is free it's paid for through some of the federal stimulus funds and it's administered through each of the counties so each of the county will be a little bit different um, and so you need to understand that we're depending on where you live, you need to make sure you have the correct contact information and the correct forms. And I know Dan and David will, will be explaining where you can find all those forms easily. But again, this is a, it's a collaborative effort to come up with Act 57. There was a lot of people involved to really think through what would be the best way to get us out of this eviction moratorium that we were in for over a year. And I do have to thank Legal Aid, I have to thank David Chi, who's on the call tonight, the Mediation Center of the Pacific, the Judiciary, Catholic, the Catholic Charities, um, White Appleseed Foundation. Uh, and so a lot, lots of people who are at the table, uh, landlord attorneys and um, the uh, Realtors Association of Hawaii where it was involved. And so I think a lot of people at the table trying to figure out all of the necessary things to make 
this transition back to some type of normalcy a success. So I'm, I'm happy that we're here to all explain this co complicated process, but I think the bottom line is to stay proactive and make sure you take advantage of both Act 57 and the CDC moratorium and rental relief so that you can get back to your feet. So thanks Majority Leader for, for having me and speaker, and I'll turn it over back to you. Thank you, Rep. Hashimoto. So our first speaker up is Jillian Okomoto from Catholic Charities Hawaii. And she's gonna give us just a little, a little brief insight into the rental assistance programs, correct? Jillian, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, as I turn it over to you, for our attendees, if you want to, you can place any questions you might have in the chat and I will be monitoring that. Jillian? Thank you so much for having me here, representatives. Uh, let me just make it into presentation mode. Okay, I hope everybody can see this. Um, thank you, um, my name is Jillian Okamoto and I am part of Catholic Charities Hawaii. I oversee our housing division. So um, as you know, uh, rental assistance is part of housing. So uh, that's why this pro uh, program falls under uh, my division. So as Rep Bilani said, um, general um, overview of the program. Um, it's basically right now, if your household is at or below 80% of the area median income. What the heck does area median, median income mean, right? It means there's a threshold. So if you make over this threshold, you may be deemed ineligible for the program. However, do not you know, uh, take that upon yourself to, to make that determination. Please just apply anyway, uh, because there are some um, other forms and other verifications that we do look at. So such as tax, your tax income of 2020. Um, so we do ask for current income, but, you know, if you are affected by COVID, say last year, we look at your 2020 taxes, and that is a acceptable uh, form of income verification. So I think that's a very important thing to know because a lot of folks um, who have gone back to work today may actually be making more than what they did back, you know, in 2020. So um, there's, there's different types of verifications that we can look at. Another main uh, eligibility requirement is you had to have experienced some type of COVID impact, um, whether that was loss of hours, loss of job, um, even if you know you might have been out of work because you you know might have had COVID um, and you're out for some time. Any kind of impact from COVID is what we're looking for for the program, um, and you also have to be at a housing instability. So that is either your past due on your rent um, or you cannot pay your rent moving forward. Uh, your past due on you know, your bills, your utility bills. So um, certain programs are doing electric, water, trash, and gas. Those are the main four. Um, if it's an unsafe or unhealthy living conditions um, and any other evidence of such risk as determined by each county. So um, our main, our biggest program that Catholic Charities is doing is for the city and county of Honolulu um, in partnership with the Council of on Native Hawaiian Advancement. So there are two agencies that are running um, the Oahu program. Um, a form that Rep. Hashimoto mentioned before is a CDC eviction declaration form. So this is very new. So if you've applied before, received assistance, and you know, you're like, what is this form? Well, this form is now, um, I guess, being active because of the CDC eviction uh, moratorium. And so it's here to protect you. Um, I believe that each county should have a link at least to their, uh, off of their websites to this form should you need it. Um, and I believe that even the mediation of Pacific should probably um, have a link to this form as well. Because again, it is very important especially for those who have not applied for assistance before. Eligible expenses, uh, we can go back until March 13, 2020 and all the way through the end of this year. Uh, we can do prospective payments. So say you're, you've been able to pay but have tapped out on your savings. There's actually future rents that we could assist with. And right now it's a, up to 12 months of assistance. So if you can imagine somebody who wasn't able to pay since April to April of this year, they've pretty much maxed out on their assistance, right? Um, there is potential for additional months of assistance, but you need to make sure that your agency that you're working with 
knows that so that you can apply for the extra months. Here is the city and county of Honolulu's information. So if um, you go to oneoahu.org slash rent help, um, unfortunately you will see today that it has actually paused. Um, so just FYI, sign up for the notifications, um, which is gonna be on my next slide, but we it, it just paused, I believe today. So it was open for about a week and I think maybe a half um, for 5,000 um, applicants. And again, this is just for Oahu. So anybody on the neighbor islands, um, I'll have um, links for you guys on the next one. Uh, one application per household is basically one lease equals one household. Um, I know that there are a lot of maybe um, um, like unit sharers. So like room A, room B, room C, as long as you each have your own lease, um, please apply. And then landlords and property managers can apply on behalf of the renter with the renter's consent. And if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, so like I said, it is paused. Um, you'll see on my slide that uh, you have to sign up for a notification email. So please do that. Um, the notification email will tell you when uh, it is open again. And you can also find frequently asked questions on the website as well. Here are the other counties uh, websites and Catholic Charities is also um, helping with the distribution for Maui County as well. Um, lots, of, lots of room to apply in Maui County. So please, if you know anybody, have them apply. And just a little bit of um, help us help you um, tips and stuff. It, you know, we've been doing rental assistance for a while now and we know that it is very stressful it you know brings a lot of anxiety, especially if you're waiting. Um, we also are waiting because we have to wait for documents, etc. Um, we do go by you know usually the order received. We did have a prioritization process in the beginning, which has since been lifted. But you know, patience, please have patience. Um, it takes time to process an application. It, you know, if you can imagine five thousand applications now that. Uh, Catholic Charities and CNHA has to go through, it will take some time. Um, accuracy of information. So because it takes a lot of time, it's really important to be accurate. If you leave out one letter of your email or have a space in your email, we are going to not be able to get a hold of you. That is probably the main mode. Um, if you don't have email and then you miss, you know, type your phone number, then we will really truly be unable to assist. So um, make sure that you have your information correct, okay? Um, a, lot, a lot of times we do a lot of back and forth with people um, because they have blurry or pictures they send in with shadows. So we cannot tell what things are. Um, we've even had people mistakenly, you know, use their iPhones, I guess, and upload pictures of their, their pets and whatnot. So we're gonna have to go back and forth um, to get that correct image. Um, and another big thing is to check your emails, uh, missed calls and voicemail. Uh, if you don't have your voicemail set up, I highly suggest you set it up. I also highly suggest that you empty your voicemails because how um, the agencies are working is, you know, we're gonna not just do one mode of communication, it's gonna be a couple. So it'll usually be an email, then a phone call, with a voicemail, should you not answer. And sometimes we'll even go to um, airmail, depending if you are technology challenged and you need you know, some help with um, doing things with, with um, the computer, um, or if you need it um, as a paper application and whatnot. But that's the kind of stuff that we talk about um, to make sure that we are giving you the best opportunity to apply. Okay, so the main key though is to apply. Um, sometimes our emails also go to your spam or junk folders. So please also check those folders as well. And I think that was my last slide. So I will still be here. Thank you so much, Jillian. I think those were just such great 
useful practical tips for people who are trying to navigate the confusing rental assistance system. I want to turn it now over to Dan and David, our uh, lawyers on the call. Dan is with Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, and I believe David Chi or David Chi, uh, attorney at law. So I wanted to give you both uh, 10 minutes a piece or 10 minutes together to just give some insights from the perspective of the attorneys as to this, um, this the place we are in now with the moratorium. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate the introduction. Um, I've never been introduced as being part of legal aid before, so I, I think that probably uh, created a lot of shock over at legal aid. <laughs> but um, uh, so Dan and I were working with uh, Representative Hashimoto and the working group to uh, draft up Act 57. So I want to kind of start off by telling you where we uh, were before what Act 57 is doing and where, uh, where I think things are, are, are heading right now. So in, in the past, when a landlord had a and tenant, uh, when a landlord had a tenant that hadn't paid the rent, um, Hawaii had a really simple law and said that the landlord, before filing the uh, lawsuit against the tenant to evict them, had to give the tenant a notice that said, "Hey, you have to pay your rent within five business days." And after five business days, if the tenant didn't pay the rent, then the landlord could go file an eviction lawsuit. When the governor um, started the eviction moratorium, what he did was he suspended that law and he made it so that landlords could not file uh, a summary possession or eviction lawsuit um, uh, when a tenant didn't pay the rent. So what Act 57 does is, you know, in recognition of the fact that you can't have that situation go on forever, because if you do, then you're not going to have any more landlords. Uh, but in, in recognition of that, what um, Act 57 was designed to do, as Representative Hashimoto indicated, was to uh, have a way to ease back into um, a, a world where uh, landlords could uh, file summary possession lawsuits uh, against tenants, eviction lawsuits against tenants but make it so that it wasn't um, as, as harsh as perhaps the, the way that things were before. And so the idea was that landlords would have to, instead of giving a five business day notice and then filing an eviction lawsuit, um, a landlord would be required to give a, a different notice to the tenant. And then different notice was, was a very long notice now, much more complicated than it was before. But the notice is designed to provide information uh, to the tenant that will help the tenant in uh, working with a mediator to uh, come up with a payment plan or some alternative to being evicted. And so the new law, what it requires landlords to do is give a notice to the tenant that's a 15 day notice and not only give that notice to the tenant, but also give the notice to the mediation center. And then the mediation center then will go and contact the tenant to try to arrange for a mediation session. And um, th this law went into effect on August 6th, August 7th, depending, you know, rather than being really technical about it, we can use August 7th as really the, as the official start date. And so 15 days from that would be August 22nd, 23rd, um, we are right now at the point where if a landlord has given a 15-day notice to a tenant and the tenant hasn't responded um, by uh, scheduling mediation, where uh, in, uh, eviction lawsuits can now be filed. Um, I don't know whether it's been, uh, whether there have been, have been a lot of filings or not, um, because I don't, you know, have all that data from the court, but we are now at the point where eviction lawsuits can start up again. Uh, another thing that Act 57 did was it tiered eviction uh, lawsuits so that uh, the lawsuits that we could start up with uh, would be the ones where tenants owed four months of rent or more. And then uh, 30 days from that, it'll be uh, six, uh, three months of rent. And then 60 days after that, it'll be two months of rent. 60 days after that, one month's rent. So there should be an easing in of eviction lawsuits. And my anticipation is that if you're a tenant and you owe money, 
if you can get the amount that you owe down to less than four months, then uh, you can't get evicted right now. And if you keep up with that, uh, follow the law and you get your, your, the amount that you owe down to three months or down to two months, you know, and, and keep it in sight, in sync with the law, um, you would never get evicted. So at least not for not payment, not at least not for non-payment of rent. So that's how everything was designed. But with the new CDC order that has come out, it's um, complicated things because uh, I had been anticipating that landlords would probably start to um, initiate um, eviction actions um, around now. Um, but there's been a lot of confusion as a result of the CDC order. So I think a lot of people are holding back, which um, is maybe good in some ways, but it's bad in other ways in that um, the idea was that we would start up um, with evictions and sort of ease things in. And I'm concerned, my concern right now is that perhaps that whole easing in is not going to happen because everybody's holding off because of the CDC order. Sorry, Dan, I think I went on too long. I'm going to turn it over to you now. And we'll give no, you I more time if you need it, Dan. Go ahead. No, no worries. I, I, David uh, touched on a lot of it. And I think um, what Lee Laid has is from the, the tenant's perspective. Um, and just a few things to be aware of is that um, there's a form, and I, I'm going to uh, maybe help the landlords a little bit, that repnakamura.com has a template of all of the notices for each county. And I, I mention that because as a, somebody who represents tenants, you know, your, your, your landlord is much better off by using that, you know, going to the repnakamore.com and using that form because it just gives a tenant attorney more ammunition if they mess it up somehow, which we've already seen it be messed up a little bit. So it's uh, well worth visiting that to just become familiar with that. Um, the other part is, and I'm going to just share, I think I'm going to share something quickly. It's just some information that goes to David's point about data. Um, let's see. So I think what I'm showing you is, these are just statistics that show what happened after the pandemic, the average statewide was 204 evictions a month, and it went down to 76, which is 37% of the pre-pandemic volume. And the biggest decrease was on Oahu, First Circuit. So it went from 147 a month to 42 a month, which is just 28%. Um, <clears throat> Second Circuit, which is Maui, and uh, Third Circuit for Big Island didn't have as big a drop, but they, their numbers aren't as large to start with. So what you're looking at is a lot of, for lack of a better word, is pent up demand for evictions. Um, and so what I want, the important part of this is historically 50% of people who are being evicted do not participate. They just let it go, which means that if you are doing that now, you're going to be out much quicker than you would have otherwise if you engage and try and go through the process because just showing up in court is just a huge part of the process because if you don't, and you get a court date in early September, that could be it, period. But if you go in early September, you're probably looking at you know weeks or maybe a month more to just try and work it out, more chance for rental assistance and all of those things. And with the COVID numbers, and this is also kind of important for tenants too, is the courts are open to appear in person, but they don't really want you there, right? And, and when you show up, there's not much to do the first time you show up. And that's why they're encouraging Zoom. But I think a lot of people, a lot of tenants might be discouraged by the fact that they, you say you have to show up by Zoom. But Zoom means you can call on the phone. Because literally, you can call into court on the phone. The person who answers the phone will identify you, figure out which case you're at. And the fact that you are there and you're appearing will just by itself uh, give you an opportunity to try and work things out, an opportunity to at least talk story with somebody along the way, not necessarily on that first day, but you know, I guess part of the point is don't be intimidated by the fact that it's Zoom. Use your phone and call in if you have to, even if you're not comfortable with the technology, just most people have access to a phone or find a phone. Um, 
And so really, I mean, from our perspective for tenants, it's, it's if you aren't paying your rent, work out whether you can file a CDC declaration because that, that's the sort of fundamental thing to take advantage of the protection to the extent it's there, maybe as long as October 3rd. Uh, show up in court, call call if you have to, or appear, but you know, just somehow appear because suddenly you're gonna be, you're, you're, you don't wanna be part of that 50% who just are gone on the first time the court date appears. Um, you have ways to get around it, but it's not worth it. You just, just I guess the, the main thing is just participate. I mean, if, that, if that's the one message for tenants is participate, which is a theme that everybody's talking about. And I just wanna emphasize that. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, if that's for that, I'm all okay. So. That's really great. And Dan, I think you're a really good segue into our final speaker, Tracy Wilkin of Mediation Center of the Pacific, who's gonna talk about the mediation piece of Act 57 that's so critical. And she may be able to give us some insights into what's happened since Act 57 has been passed into law. Before I turn it over to her, please webinar attendees. Um, if you have any questions, place them into the chat and we can um, ask them of the um, participants here. Otherwise you're gonna be left with questions from me and Rep Hashimoto and Speaker Psyche. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Tracy. Tracy. Thank you, Representative Bilotti, <clears throat> and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Dan, you left out something really important before going to court, they should go to mediation. So let me talk about how mediation works, how to access it, because it is a huge opportunity for landlords and tenants to work out agreements that will provide the landlord with their outstanding funds and give the tenant the ability to remain in their unit or residence. So first of all, as you heard David um, mention, under Act 57, landlords now need to provide tenants with a notice and simultaneously that notice needs to go to the mediation center on the island where the tenant resides. At the Mediation Center of the Pacific on Oahu, you can go to our website. Um, in fact, that's what you definitely should do. Don't email it to us, don't drop it off, and don't fax it to us. We want to make it easy. So go to our website at mediatehawaii.org, and there'll be a link that you click on. You'll input some information, and you can upload the notice. When you do that, you'll automatically receive documentation that shares that you provided the notice. On the neighbor islands, you can contact each of the mediation centers. All of the contact information is located on the state's website, the COVID website. All of the websites and the telephone numbers for each mediation center is on there if you have trouble. So once the landlord provides the notice to the mediation center, we're really encouraging the tenants to reach out to that mediation center. Each mediation center will also be proactively reaching out to the tenant. So I can't emphasize enough um, as everyone else has, when we call you, please answer your phone. When we leave a message, please call us back because you have 15 days to schedule that mediation under Act 57. And so that's huge, not only because you get to participate in mediation, but also then if you schedule a mediation session within 15 days, then the landlord can't move forward with the eviction process they'll be required to participate in mediation. Now, ideally, the mediation session will be scheduled within 30 days from the date of the notice. And then ideally in mediation, you'll reach an agreement so neither landlord or tenant will ever have to go to court. And that's really the whole focus. And I'm not saying that every single one will result in agreement, but I will tell you to date, the cases that we have um, had in mediation have all reached agreements. So let me tell you how mediation works. The landlord, the tenant will schedule a mediation session with the staff at the mediation center. Landlord will receive a notice regarding the, an electronic notice. So again, check your email, check your trash um, to get the email. And it will tell you the date and time of the mediation session. It will also provide you with a Zoom link. Now, majority of the mediations will take place via Zoom. We do recognize that not everyone's comfortable participating electronically. You might not have the right equipment. The Mediation Center of the Pacific and the other mediation centers across the state will provide uh, limited 
in-person mediations. And we're really trying to limit it, especially now with the high COVID numbers. The other important thing to know at the Mediation Center of the Pacific is we have mediation rooms that are equipped with video conference equipment. So you can still participate remotely by coming to our office. You can be in a mediation room by yourself safely and have staff support to help set you up in that Zoom mediation. So I would encourage you to do that if you're not comfortable with the, if you don't have the right equipment or you're not comfortable doing it on your own. We're also reaching out to various organizations in the community. Um, so you might wanna reach out to organizations in your community to see if they have a space and computer available to allow you to participate there because many organizations are willing to do that. So we set it up via Zoom. We schedule the sessions for an hour and a half. Some won't take as long, others need that full hour and a half. Prior to the mediation, you'll receive an electronic confidentiality agreement that we ask everyone sign. It's through PandaDoc. So again, check your trash, check your emails um, to be able to sign that confidentiality agreement. Then you meet with a mediator via Zoom. The mediator, it's important to remember, is impartial. They're not going to tell you what to do. They don't make decisions for you, and they don't give you legal advice. What they do do is ask both landlord and tenant a lot of questions, and they look for areas of potential agreement. The other important thing I want to emphasize is generally we start with landlord and tenant together, and then the mediator will meet with each of you privately. If you're not comfortable being together, you can ask um, when the mediation is set up and the mediator will respect that and work with you strictly in private sessions, going back and forth, um, meeting with each of you privately. So mediators ask questions such as, have you applied for rental assistance? Because that's really critical. And if you haven't, why not? A lot of our mediated agreements to date involve landlord and tenant reaching agreements, how they're gonna to work together to apply for rental assistance, which is critical because then landlord will receive money owed, tenant will be able to remain in the unit. They'll also ask questions such as, what's your vision for the future? Um, for a tenant, are you planning to stay? And if yes, how are you planning to afford that? Do you have a job now? Um, are you able to make payments? Once rental assistance is gone, Will you have enough money to pay the rent? Um, and if not, then it may be time to start thinking about other options. And same with the landlord. What is your idea of a good tenant? Did you have a good relationship prior to COVID? And if your tenant could pay the rent monthly on a timely basis, would you wanna keep them there? Because that's your definition of a good tenant. So through these discussions going back and forth, uh, landlord and tenant agree to work together to apply for rental assistance. They've worked out payment plans. Sometimes it's a matter of the tenant um, coming up with additional payments now that they're working or have additional funding that they didn't have last year. Sometimes landlords have agreed to um, waive back rent, some of it or all of it, if the tenant can now start paying rent on time. Um, so there's a broad variety of agreements that are worked out um, that enable landlord and tenant to move forward. And the mediator will help memorialize that and have both of them sign it electronically. And what's important is if they reach an agreement, then neither have to go to court. And that's to the advantage of both landlord and tenant. Um, landlord doesn't have to spend their time and their money um, going through the eviction process. Tenant doesn't have to be evicted. Um, which is important, um, and they can build a better relationship going through mediation. So it sounds simple. I know that it's overwhelming for people. It's overwhelming to think about participating via Zoom. It's scary for a tenant to receive the eviction notice. And unfortunately, as Dan said, going to court, a lot of tenants don't respond to that. Well, a lot of tenants aren't responding to the notice to um, call the mediation center or our outreach. And so it's really important to know that you need to reach out and schedule that mediation session. And I will say to date, we've received over 300 notices from landlords. We've reached out to every tenant and less than half of the tenants have responded. 
And I'm going to emphasize again, those tenants who have responded and have participated in a mediation session have reached agreements with their landlords. Um, and those agreements have enabled tenants to remain in their homes, work together with their landlords. Some of them have agreed on new leases that will take them into the future. So there's a lot of options and opportunity. Um, so I'll end at that point and then we can entertain questions. Thank you so much. I mean, we really did get the spectrum um, of perspectives on this issue. So I wanna thank again, our panelists. Um, I wanna remind webinar attendees that we do have the chat feature. So please place your questions in the chat box. And our very first question is, I think gonna be directed to our lawyers on the call. It's from Dennis Tanimoto who asked, what about those homeowners? So now we're not talking about renters, but homeowners who are past due on their mortgage payments. Are they protected in any way from eviction or foreclosure by their mortgage holders? That may be a more complicated question, but I will look to David or Dan to see if you want to try to respond to that. I, I can start by, uh, if there's money that's gonna become available, it's not available yet, and Jillian might know more about it, but there is gonna be money available for, for mortgage holders. Um, it hasn't come out yet. And if you are behind on your mortgage, hopefully you've engaged with your lender because depending on what type of mortgage you have, if you had something that was backed by the federal government like a Fannie Mae or VA or FHA, you are still entitled to some forbearance protection. So you could um, address the issue of not being able to pay your mortgage. But if you're not one of those types of mortgage holders, then yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The protection is only what you can negotiate with your lender and whatever might become available that Jilling might be able to address as far as um, assistance for mortgage holders. Before we go to Jillian, David, did you want to speak to anything about uh, the mortgage homeowner situation? Yeah, I, you know, what I was going to say was, I feel you, man. I mean, because that is exactly the problem. You know, we have a public health problem and it should be the public that pays for the public health problem. Instead, what we've got is a shifting of costs onto the landlords of the world um, to pay for the housing for the tenants of the world. And to me, that, that doesn't seem particularly fair. Well, I mean, it doesn't seem fair at all. But the thing that I, I would um, keep in mind is that the rental aid that is available, the, the whole scheme of things was that if there were these moratoriums, the idea was that uh, was not to necessarily leave landlords in a lurch. The idea was to feed them all of this money through the federal funds in order to uh, make landlords whole again. Unfortunately, the way that the federal government set it up is that, well, you have to have uh, no more than 80% of area median income. Well, that necessarily knocks out more than 50% of the, of, the, of the people because median income is in the middle. So 80% of the middle means less than 50%. So really, if you've got uh, tenants who are anything beyond median income, those folks aren't going to get any rental aid. Um, and so I, I do think that the way that the system has, has rolled out has not been fair to, uh, to landlords, but I will encourage landlords, all of them, if you have tenants who are eligible for rental aid, you know, it can mean a lot of money. I've had uh, one of my clients got, I think, a check for $27,000. Um, you know, it can be a lot of money if you, uh, if you help your tenants get to the rental aid. So Jillian, can I turn to you the question? I mean, I, this is news to me. I, I'm sure you folks all know, but there's, so there's mortgage assistance coming as well. Yes. So um, there is a homeowner's assistance fund that I believe is being shaped now. Um, the release date, though, I am not entirely sure, but um, I think it's coming in another package um, from the feds. And, you know, piggybacking on um, David's um, comments is that if you are a landlord and your tenants are not, you know, like cooperating or if they don't know what to do, um, you can always contact any of the agencies that are running these, um, these programs because landlords can apply um, on behalf of their tenants. Um, but, you know, if Mr. Tanimoto is a, you know, just a single family home and he's not a landlord, mortgage assistance should be coming hopefully before the end of summer. Um, but again, I am not entirely sure. 
So we will continue to monitor that, Mr. Tanimoto, and all our viewers. But you know, there certainly are pockets of money that are out there. And so we really encourage you, as I think has been one of the themes in this webinar, is that you need to reach out. You need to reach out and be proactive. Um, we are heading at the uh, last 15 minutes. And I want to really encourage folks to um, ask any questions that, that they might have. Um, I'm going to look to my two colleagues, Speaker Saiki or Rep Hashimoto, if you want to ask any questions on behalf and channel your constituents. Um, otherwise, I think that so far I've heard a lot of good um, pieces of practical advice about reaching out for a rental assistance, for other utility assistance as well. It's something that Julian didn't mention, but that there are resources out there. Um, I also invite the um, our panelists, if you want to engage with each other and ask each other questions, I'd also encourage that. I would like to make a quick point, uh, Majority Leader. I think one of, one of the things that we know from the federal stimulus package, um, the latest, uh, ARP, uh, I guess, funds that came in at, uh, in the new year was that $50 million will come to Hawaii for mortgage, mortgage relief. So how, what is the qualifications? I think that is still kind of being worked out and how it's going to be disseminated that that will still be coming. But we know that the, the general figure is statewide, it's $50 million. I think other, some of the neighbor island counties and just depending on what pro, uh, kind of federal funds they were using, I know there have been previous mortgage relief programs using community development block grant funding. Um, and so, you know, I think there's just a wide array of resources out there. So I think people just need to keep an eye on that. It's going to vary by county, but there is a tremendous amount of aid out there that is available. I think sometimes it goes, there's a perception that it goes quickly. And yes, it, sometimes it does go quickly. But I think we, I wanted to make sure that people knew that, you know, if you are a landlord, just as David said, and you have an uncooperative tenant, you know, you as a landlord can, you um, take action. And I think maybe Jillian, you can explain what is that process if you are a landlord and need to go through that process of making sure that, you know, you have to go without, what, what do they need if, you, if your, your tenant's not cooperative? And also if you're a tenant, what if your landlord is kind of not being cooperative? <laughs> what's your option there? Um, let me do the latter first. If you have an uncooperative landlord, um, there is a clause in the guidance that we follow if your landlord is unresponsive for um, a certain number of business days, then we can go ahead and pay out the actual tenant, um, provided they are eligible uh, and have applied, et cetera. Um, if you have a um, uncooperative tenant, on the other hand, um, the hard part is that guidance says that you need consent um, to apply on their behalf. I mean, you're gonna need uh, certain type of documents as well. Um, We've been pretty successful in, you know, um, kind of like being the mediator um, in, you know, to help the tenant understand that, you know, you're not in trouble. You just need to give consent. And so we try and, um, you know, help that process move forward between the two parties. Um, and we even, I mean, we've even called certain um, different household members, you know, maybe if they'd be willing to, if the head of household, you know, wasn't, um, um, cooperative. And so we've been pretty successful if we had um, cases like that. Can I add in just real quick? I, I'd say that um, one of the things that the new law does is actually drives people to uh, get rental aid in that um, the, the whole system is set up so that the first thing that should be happening is uh, people engaging in mediation. And the mediators all know um, what rental aid is available. And what and the easiest uh, solution to a non-payment problem is a whole bunch of free money, and which is exactly what that rental aid is. So um, the 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 act the the law basically drives people tenants to mediation if they participate, and at mediation they can uh, come into contact with aid to help them solve their problems. The other thing that the act does is that. Uh, well, if, if somebody doesn't participate in mediation at the beginning of things and doesn't get to the aid, well, then the landlord can bring the eviction lawsuit and force the tenant to go to court. And then at court, the court can order everybody to mediation. And then, you know, once again, get the tenants an opportunity to get aid. But, you know, if, if people don't take the opportunity that's given to them, then they're going to end up evicted. So, you know, the, the choice really gets down to, you know, will you take the helping hand that the federal government and all these other people are, are offering, 
um, which is, you know, free money. I mean, I, I've, I've never thought it was going to be so difficult to give away free money. But if you, if you don't take advantage of it, then um, you're going to lose it and probably lose your home. I want to ask, uh, build on something that Jillian has said, maybe something we see and maybe you can clarify it, Jillian, a little bit, is that um, if people have got their income and you touched on it, if their job has come back and they're over the median income, doesn't mean they don't qualify for something that happened in the past because they might have missed November through March when they couldn't work. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that people, I mean, you mentioned it, but it's something that matters because some people are getting their jobs back. And the other one, and I don't know the answer to this, maybe you do, if if somebody's coming today for rental assistance and they're planning on leaving in September, can they still apply for rental assistance knowing that by the time the process is over, they might be out? I mean, I might be moving September 1st, but I'm gonna to apply today because I owe the landlord money and they might think, well, I can't get it because I'm moving. I don't know whether you've, how often you face that, or is that a is that a barrier that you've seen at all? So in past programs, it has been a barrier. We were unable to pay for a unit you have moved out of. Um, however, this one is a little bit more flexible. Um, we could potentially pay for something that you are no longer living in, uh, should you had have difficulties paying that rent due to COVID. Um, and yes, if you are if you applied in this batch and then you're moving to a new unit starting September 1st, technically we could cover your prorated whatever rent you have left in August that you may not have paid and then moving forward for your, your new unit. So and that, that expands it a lot. Yeah, I think people need to know it. And, and Jillian, one other question that, I, that you were talking about the batches, is there a batch that's coming up that's gonna be even have different criteria that aren't, are, for lack of a better word, less stringent down the road? So um, it's it's gonna get very confusing, but technically we are in phase, I think ERA one, so emergency rental assistance one, um, and then ERA two is coming up and it has different, I'm gonna say requirements. So um, that doesn't mean though that the main eligibility for ERA one goes away. No, it does not. It just, I think, is a little bit looser and we and technically agencies can pay for different additional items to help with housing stability. Um, that is determined by each county though, and depending on you know what they deem as um, housing stability. So um, an example could be moving expenses. You know, we don't want you to become homeless because you cannot afford movers. Um, so that might be, and again, might be um, included should this, the counties um, determine that as a um, eligible expense. Yeah, I mean, Julian, I try to make the point that nobody really has it all down pat and that you're not going to know unless you try because you might be surprised at what you can get if you just engage and ask because, you know, you guys are all very creative and trying to figure out how to make it work. And I think that's what people have to realize is that you're, you're trying to help them out as opposed to finding ways not to help because that's that's truly the goal. And that was my, that, that's all I wanted to point out. So we're coming to the final of five minutes of this webinar. And I wanna thank everyone. There is a question in the chat. Again, thank you, Mr. Tanimoto. The question is, will a recording of this webinar be made available to attendees? It will be available on at reps Scott Psyche's Facebook and Instagram um, platform. So please go visit that. But I also want to put a pitch in. Rep Hashimoto is reaching out to other members of the house and will be conducting webinars or uh, similar uh, virtual town hall meetings like this. And as you can just tell um, from this conversation, things are in flux. So I urge you to continue to reach out and find out information. Um, you can go on um, many of our uh, house representative platforms to find out information when the next webinar will be. We will pass that information along as well to our District 24 and District 26 attendees. Um, I'm gonna uh, wrap this up by having each one of you and we'll go 
in reverse order. So we're going to start with Tracy. Sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot first for your final takeaway for this webinar. And then we'll go from Tracy, Dan, David to Jillian, and then we'll have um, Rep Hashimoto and Speaker Psyche wrap up with any of their own closing comments to um, end this uh, very, very informative webinar. Go ahead, Tracy. Thanks, Representative. So I'm just going to reemphasize again for tenants to contact the Mediation Center on your island when you receive the notice from your landlord. Uh, mediation is not a scary process. It's free to landlord and tenant. Uh, and the other thing I didn't mention, um, if you need an interpreter, if that would assist you in participating, an interpreter will be provided for you. And again, at no cost. So I encourage you to reach out to the Mediation Center on your island and participate. Thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Dan, you're up. Dan, you're on mute. There is a question about resources and legalaidhawaii.org has information for both landlords and tenants. We have basic flyers because a lot of this is confusing. And I saw there's a question in the Q&A about that. And so I want to make sure that that's one resource. Um, I know that the Office of Consumer Protection, the landlord tenant hotline is another resource. Um, and, you know, tenants in particular, call Legal Aid Hawaii. Um, just call us. And we'll, we'll tell you what we know. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. David, you're up next. Yeah, I just wanted to tell everybody that I, I, I think it's really important to uh, participate in, you know, if you get if you get the notice from your landlord, you know, make sure that you try to engage in mediation. Uh, really, uh, there's nothing good that's going to happen if you just ignore it. Um, it just makes, it, honestly, it makes my job a lot easier. If I'm going to be evicting somebody, um, the person who doesn't engage, that's the easiest person to evict. So uh, if you don't want to be that person, then engage. Thank you so much, Jillian, and then Rep Hashimoto followed by Speaker Psyche. Um, my only thing is, you know, to just make sure that you don't make your own determination and you help us uh, make the, you know, eligibility determination for you um, and try and push through application burnout. Um, I know that there's a lot of documents you're going to need to, you know, put forth, answer a lot of questions, but this is meant for you to keep your housing. So please, please, please apply and uh, push through that. Rep Hashimoto. No, so thanks again for, for hosting this, this webinar. And I think I want to continue to emphasize that everyone needs to be proactive, apply for rental relief, go through the mediation process. You can mediate now. You don't have to wait for the mediation. I think the tier system is in place for those going to court, not the mediation. So make sure you take advantage of the free mediation that we have offered. And make sure that you, if there's a CDC moratorium that you can apply for, do so. But you cannot no longer just wait on the sidelines. You actually have to do something. And I think there's a lot of resources available to you and people here to help. So just make sure you take advantage of everything that's out there for you. And final closing comments, Speaker Psyche. Yes, yeah, so I just want to thank um, um, the, all the viewers who watched this tonight, this evening. I also want to thank all of our panelists. This is probably one of the most informative um, panels or webinars that I've that I've been that, that I've participated in. Um, I want to thank Representative Hashimoto, who authored the legislation that created this mediation program. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for all of your work on this important issue. Aloha, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for more news uh, when we, uh, you know, have to have to um, continue to talk about and, and find solutions for this pandemic we find ourselves in. Aloha, stay safe, be well. Thank you all. <laughs>